Do you remember the last time you went down a rabbit hole with worry, tumbling down and down until it felt like all was hopeless and unfair? I do. It's a situation we all find ourselves in from time to time. Welcome back to Savvy Psychologist. I'm your host, Dr. Jade Wu, and every week I'll help you meet life's challenges with evidence-based research, a sympathetic ear, and zero judgment. Our brains are designed to look for problems and anticipate threats. We can't blame them for sometimes going overboard. But we can talk about certain mental snares and patterns that our brains can get into so we can be better prepared to get out of those thinking traps. In part one of this two-part series, we talked about three unhelpful but all-too-common patterns that our thoughts can fall into. And that included black and white thinking, which is where you see things as one way or the other with no shades of gray. We also talked about jumping to conclusions, where you convince yourself that something is true despite not having any evidence. And of course, the mental filter, where you only look for evidence that supports your beliefs, knowingly or not. You can stop struggling and find balance if you learn to catch yourself when you start forgetting about middle grounds, time traveling and mind reading, or acting like an overzealous defense lawyer. Now today in part two, let's look at three more common thinking traps that keep us hooked to the struggle. This is trap number four, emotional reasoning. I feel so embarrassed. I must have made a fool of myself. My hands are shaking and my stomach is in knots. I must be totally not ready for this conversation. I feel so blah about this project. It's probably not even worth pursuing. Our emotions are powerful guides. A sense of foreboding can warn us of danger. A burst of joy can reaffirm a relationship. And sadness can tell us where our spiritual priorities lie. But sometimes we end up reading too much into emotions, imbuing them with more meaning than they were supposed to convey. For example, just because you feel embarrassed doesn't mean you actually made a fool of yourself. We often judge ourselves more harshly than others do. Stuttering a line in the wedding toast or making a conversational faux pas with a stranger might send heat rushing to your cheeks. That automatic response reflects your body's knee-jerk reaction and not necessarily your brain's careful consideration of the facts. So, just because you feel embarrassed doesn't mean you actually did something embarrassing. It's a similar story with other emotions and situations. Just because you don't feel excited about starting a new project at work doesn't mean it's not a meaningful one. It's worth listening to your emotions as a hint to figure out what makes you hesitate. Perhaps there's some part of the project that isn't aligning with your values, or maybe you've taken on too much work overall. But don't write off the whole opportunity yet. Your heart's lack of enthusiasm might not mean the whole situation is a lost cause. Trap number five is catastrophizing. It's the end of the world. The whole party is ruined. I've lost all chance at setting things right with this relationship. We've all had these types of thoughts. You accidentally hit reply all on an email that was supposed to be a one-on-one. -on -one. You made an awkward comment in front of someone you were hoping to impress. You had a messy breakup and you're worried that you burned bridges. This is what I mean by catastrophizing. It's taking one bad moment and painting your whole world and future with its dark colors. It's making an embarrassing or disappointing molehill into the Mount Everest of failure. Let's put things in perspective. Can you think of anyone else who experienced a less than glamorous moment and survived to tell the tale? How about Beyonce and other megastars? In 2007, Beyonce tripped and face-planted while performing for a huge crowd in Orlando. Katy Perry got stuck on a giant cake and repeatedly failed to get up and had to be carried off stage. Fergie didn't get to use the bathroom before a performance, and let's just say the adrenaline probably didn't help her hold it while a huge crowd watched that strangely growing dark spot on her pants. Yikes! What do you think was going on in these stars' minds in those moments? Beyonce could have thought, 
Well, that's it. I've ruined my flawless reputation of elegance and glamour. Fergie could have thought, well, my career is ruined. It wouldn't be hard to think like that when thousands of people have watched you mess up. But these ladies kept going. Today, they're still the super successful and admired icons they've always been. It turns out that tripping and slipping were not the only things they've done in public. They've also put out some hit songs. So, when you get stuck on your own oops moments or heartbreaks, it may help to zoom out and see other parts of the picture. Sure, if you hold up a magnifying glass up to any one event, it's sure to take up your whole horizon. Wouldn't it be more helpful to see it as just one relatively small piece of your big life? And trap number six, which is last but certainly not least, holding on to should. I shouldn't have to tell her why I'm upset. She should already know. I shouldn't have been so naive after getting my heart broken. My boss shouldn't pick favorites. She should promote me because I'm the most productive person here. Of course, it can be useful to say a passionate should sometimes. Like when you're a legislator trying to write a law to guarantee basic human rights for people. But in a lot of everyday situations, holding stubbornly onto should is like shackling yourself to a wall and complaining that you can't leave the room. It sure can feel like your partner should know that her careless remark hurt your feelings. But what if she doesn't? What if she didn't mean to be hurtful and is oblivious about how her words made you feel? Insisting in your mind that you should know only keeps her in the dark longer and keeps you simmering in your dissatisfaction. In the end, who pays the price for this should? When the should is about someone else, you get mad and stew in resentment. When the should is about ourselves, we feel ashamed and miserable. I wish our collective passion for how things should be could change this. And sometimes it does. The idea that women should be considered full citizens led to social movements that eventually got us the right to vote. I am personally quite grateful for all the shoulds that the suffragettes shouted. But unfortunately, the world and sometimes our actions can be full of injustice, misunderstanding, and disappointment. In our own lives, we get to choose the battles we fight. If there's something you value enough to stake your shoulds on it, no matter the effort and risks involved, go for it. But if it's not a fundamental life value at risk, but rather a conflict that could cost you your relationships, energy, and good spirits, try letting go of the should. Replace it should be with I wish it were in your mind. Then see what you can work with to improve the situation. Don't forget that with all the thinking traps we've reviewed here and in part one, it's all about finding more balance and flexibility. The point is not to turn negatives into positives. That kind of emotional alchemy is not so easy or sustainable. Instead, we're trying to be more in touch with reality by looking for facts, looking at the whole picture, and letting ourselves out of the should cage. Thinking traps don't have to keep you ensnared. When you learn to recognize them, you can set yourself free. And with that, I'll set you free for the week. You are welcome to go and check out other podcasts like other episodes of The Savvy Psychologist, which you can find on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you'd like more psychology tips delivered straight to your inbox, subscribe to The Savvy Psychologist newsletter. You can also find me on Facebook and Twitter. I'm at QDT Savvy Psych and at Jade Wu PhD. Savvy Psychologist is audio engineered by Steve Rickyberg and edited by Karen Hertzberg. As always, Savvy Psychologist is strictly for informational purposes and does not substitute for mental health care from a licensed professional. Thank you so much for joining me, and I'll see you next week for a happier, healthier mind. <laughs>